de Berlin Interdisciplinary Workshop on Team Brain Generator 17. And as you could see probably quickly this morning in uh, Laurent's presentation, uh, he co-edited the new Springer, Springer Handbook of Auditory Research, uh, uh, volume on Timbre, uh, published in July 2019. So today, Charis uh, talk is on uh, revisiting brightness uh, perception for uh, musical instrument sounds. Uh, over to you, Charis. Okay. Uh, thank you, Frederic. Um, I hope everybody can uh, listen to me fine and see the slides. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to this um, conference. Uh, thank you, Laurent, for contacting me a couple of years ago. Um, I really wish I was in, in France right now, uh, uh, but unfortunately, um, we, we have to adapt in these uh, crazy times. Um, and it's also great to see that, um, you know, there is there is this momentum on, on time by research uh, that has been going on for, I would say, about 10 years now. Um, and uh, it's glad to see that this is ongoing and uh, so far uh, many interesting talks and um, it becomes uh, more and more important. Uh, you know, how timber basically affects so many aspects in research of um, not only music, musicology, uh, music psychology, but also generally um, the cognitive sciences. So it's, it's a great tool for understanding um, how uh, humans perceive um, uh, stimuli, um, how our senses operate um, and how we um, and how they variate from one person to another. Um, so in uh, in my talk today, um, I will be talking about a recent work um, that I did with um, Kai Zinnenberg at the at the University of Oldenburg and um, Christoph Reuter at the University of Vienna in um, uh, revisiting brightness perception for musical instrument sounds um, and um, exploring um, some. Uh, 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 more detailed questions than the broader picture um, we, are, we are all aware of. Um, and uh, of course, you know, um, this is a timber conference and already within the first uh, four talks, um, brightness, or, uh, spectral brightness, timbral brightness was already mentioned um, a few times and it was even described as the most important or the uh, the the most prevalent, let's say, timbral um, dimension. Um, all right, so I'm gonna play um, for sounds, which are um, um, ordered uh, in terms of brightness, uh, not by me, but actually by, by listeners that I will be talking about um, later. So this is a bassoon note. This is a marimba. Trumpet and vibraphone, and I've separated them a little bit because the bassoon and the trumpet are both, um, let's say, sustained um, sounds, and the marimba and the vibraphone are more um, uh, impulsive, percussive type of, of sounds. Um, and uh, usually. Um, uh, when we talk about timbral brightness, we think of, uh, for example, that this sound of the trumpet and this sound of the bassoon, they're, they're played at the same loudness, at the same pitch, uh, same duration. So we can somehow say that trumpet sounds brighter um, than the bassoon. And similarly, uh, the vibraphone sounds brighter than the marimba. Um, if we follow um, the very sort of uh, strict definition of timbre that it is everything else uh, that cannot be accounted for by pitch or loudness or duration or um, the acoustics of the environment, then uh, this difference we perceive in, in brightness is, is some sort of timbral dimension. Um, so timbral brightness is, is, is one of the most important um, aspects in auditory perception. It is something that is communicated um, by musicians, composers, audio engineers, audiophiles, 
Um, it systematically emerges as a major dimension of timber in, uh, in empirical research, which I will discuss in a bit as well, um, when we uh, do the similarity comparisons uh, between sounds or when we um, rate um, a sound in terms of brightness and other semantic scales. Um, uh, in, in a research um, uh, looking at how timbre is described in orchestration books, um, the words brilliant, dark, and bright independently were in the top five attributes. Um, so, um, uh, or um, in, in a more audio engineering context, um, when people uh, look for uh, sound effects in, in online, in, in libraries, in sound databases, brightness is in the top three descriptions they use. Um, even in, 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 in singing, for example, the bel canto singing style, um, brightness as part of the chiaroscuro um, tradition is very central. Um, the ideal singing voice has to have a bright edge as well as a dark round quality. Um, it is even an important factor in concert hall acoustics, so uh, research trying to develop um, sort of uh, verbal-based semantic um, uh, tools for measuring the quality of a concert hall, um, they, they now share um, at least one factor that is related to brightness or, or luminance, if you want. Um, yet, however, um, there is, um, we still um, don't understand um, the finer details of the perceptual and cognitive construct of uh, timber brightness. Um, so, going back a little bit to the empirical uh, research component. Um, so, one major stride in, in timber research is the similarity ratings. So, you have a set of sounds. Um, and you ask people to rate uh, all possible pairwise combinations as to how similar or dissimilar they sound. Everything is supposedly equalized in terms of pitch and loudness, so you don't have any other auditory, let's say, dimensions um, confounding. Um, and through some multidimensional scaling and through extracting audio descriptors um, from uh, the sounds, uh, we perform, we attempt some sort of psychophysical interpretation and already some of the important words in that um, field were reported in, in earlier talks like uh, the work by Gray, the work by McAdams and so on. Um, this this uh, line of research has shown us two um, uh, salient dimensions that more or less emerge in any type um, of sounds. Um, and this is the um, a temporal dimension that seems related to attack time, uh, correlated, let's say, to the audio descriptor of attack time, which is um, we measure um, uh, the duration between the, the onset of the sound and the onset of the sustained part. Um, and the spectral centroid, which is um, the amplitude weighted mean frequency. So it's basically roughly um, the spectral center of gravity, kind of the middle point um, uh, that sort of splits uh, the energy of the spectrum in two. Um, a, a parallel line of research in, in, uh, in timbre is what, what is often called as timbre semantics, um, where um, each sound is rated along uh, directly now on its own, along a set of scales, of verbal scales, bright, dark, smooth, um, rough. Um, and then uh, we perform some factor analysis or principal component analysis. And again, um, we extract some audio descriptors and we try to, um, while we first identify some uh, dominant, um, uh, some factors that can explain the, the underlying variation, um, we also try to psychophysically explain them. Um, so the most prominent uh, such factors are usually associated with texture, so words like smooth, rough, um, and uh, harsh. And then there is the luminance dimension. I'm using here a term proposed by um, Zaharakis and colleagues in 2014. Uh, it's just another word for brightness, um, simply because uh, with luminance you can include things like darkness, dullness, um, brilliance, and so on all words that seem to load on the same underlying factor. Um, and eventually what happens is that um, 
the speckel centroid uh, has been shown to very well explain um, direct ratings of, of brightness. Um, and so usually the speckel centroid dimension in the dissimilarity ratings um, is interpreted as being a brightness dimension. Um, the and let's uh, let's now see a little bit again um, what this means. So here we have uh, the bassoon, for example, and the marimba, and then the trumpet, and then the vibraphone, and we can see that there is indeed a progression of um, energy being transferred from uh, the very low um, uh, parts of the spectrum, the very low frequencies, uh, gradually to the upper um, regions. Uh, and this is something that the spectral centroid as a scalar audio descriptor um, seems to, to capture um, relatively well. Um, now, however, um, nobody has really um, asked the question whether the brightness dimension of timber spaces, so the spectral centroid dimension of timber spaces, would be recovered from direct brightness ratings. Um, and a similar question is how robust are brightness judgments across different psychoacoustical contexts, different tasks? Um, so to, to answer that question, we thought of combining um, general dissimilarity ratings with uh, direct multistimulus brightness ratings. And I will explain in a bit what uh, multistimulus um, means. Um, Another aspect um, that hasn't been addressed very much is the dimensionality, the potential dimensionality of timber brightness. So um, yes, the spectral centroid is a good predictor, but spectral envelopes of sounds can vary in manifold ways, certainly more than can be captured by a one-dimensional scalar audio descriptor. Um, and um, there are some examples, uh, for example, um, consistent shifts of perceived brightness between formant-like synthetic tones, um, where the speckle centroid values were very similar, um, were observed. Um, and uh, from the more, so this is more coming from psychoacoustical research, whereas from more timber semantics um, works, um, we also have sounds described as thick, dense, or rich, described also as less bright or brilliant, um, indicating an interplay between spectral energy distribution, which is what the spectral centroid descriptor um, kind of tries to model, and spectral detail, um, so the finer detail of, of, um, of the spectrum, perhaps around the centroid uh, region, for example. Um, in, in, in a study uh, that, uh, in a project that I think two of our speakers, uh, Mathieu Later and uh, George Fazekas tomorrow, um, have been involved, um, uh, Audio Commons, which was a European project involving some UK um, researchers, um, they tried to develop a model of brightness um, after collecting ratings in 200 sound. Uh, 210 sounds, excuse me, over 33 source types. So going a bit beyond the classic timber research paradigm of single isolated notes played always at the same pitch. So they had different source types, including electronic sounds, um, and um, they varied more aspects than we usually do with, with um, timber research. Um, and uh, so a model that explained well um, the ratings um, had the speckle centroid above the cutoff frequency, um, so not just the speckle centroid, um, combined in a sort of linear model with uh, the ratio of high frequency energy to the total energy. Um, so our second question then was, um, could brightness be a lump sum of multiple attributes that are collectively associated um, with brightness, but separate if we consider them in greater detail. And this is why we then had the idea of collecting brightness dissimilarity ratings. So basically looking at brightness perception through um, the lens of, uh, through the empirical, the methodological lens of uh, general time of perception. Um, uh, and that sort of led us to, to a third um, question, um, the relationship between timber dissimilarity and source cause categories. And I will explain in a bit what that is. So if we hear um, a guitar, 
and the violin pizzicato. So some people might group these uh, uh, sounds close in a dissimilarity uh, scenario, uh, sorry, in a dissimilarity task. Um, some listeners might group this, uh, might place the sounds very close because they share the same impulsive envelope or because they both represent um, the same sort of source cause. We have a plucked string um, and a wooden resonator. Um, or because there is some sort of semantic connection, uh, they both sound, for example, very abrupt. Um, and um, in, a, in a very nice work uh, by Lemaitre and colleagues um, in um, uh, mostly environmental sounds, um, they proposed that there is generally these three types of similarity that listeners use to, to um, infer how similar one timbre is to another. Um, so there is acoustical, um, so we, we solely re rely on, on acoustical cues, on spectral or temporal cues. There is the causal um, similarity, which is that it's more categorical, so we kind of recognize, we group together things that belong to the same category. And then there's the semantic, which is also sort of categorical. Um, now, the classical time versus similarity studies implicitly assume that um, the similarity that listeners use is purely acoustical. And this is also what justifies, um, you know, trying to find um, continuously varying audio descriptors that explain the dimensions of a time or space. However, um, most of the studies have Western musical instrument tones and they are conducted with Western listeners um, who are exposed to this kind of sounds anyways. And listening experience is known to result in long-term source cause categories. Um, and these categories have been shown to infiltrate the similarity ratings. So um, when, um, when listeners uh, perform a time or similarity task, um, we can explain more variance if we take into account such categorical um, aspects of the given sounds. And um, I will, you will see this more clearly when I present the results of our first study. So the question we asked then was, could brightness the similarity show a similar influx of source cause categories? And that basically was the third question um, that we assessed by um, looking um, at the relationship between general and brightness the similarity ratings. Um, so this summarizes the, the motivation behind our first study. Um, so we had 40 musically experienced listeners, um, masters, students, um, and musicians involved with um, uh, sound design and engineering audio programs at uh, the Technical University of Berlin and the University of Berlin of the Arts. Um, all German native speakers or spoke German fluently because the task was about uh, brightness or helikite in German. So we wanted to avoid um, uh, cultural influence of how uh, of what brightness might mean. Um, and we used the exact same uh, 14 acoustic instruments uh, uh, used in, uh, uh, in the study that I just mentioned about the, the influence of source, so, uh, source cause categories. Um, all sounds at the same pitch, um, same duration, uh, same dynamics, um, uh, classic diotic experiment, uh, only left channels, and of course, um, loudness was matched. And you can see here, and this will become important a bit later, um, that some of the some the sounds were selected based also on families and source cause categories that they belong to. Um, and here we have the the design. So um, half of the listeners first um, uh, did a general dissimilarity task, then they did a brightness dissimilarity task. And finally, they did um, a direct um, uh, ratings task. Um, the other half did first the brightness dissimilarity, the then the general dissimilarity, the and again at the end they did the, the direct ratings. Um, we we did a simple scaling of the direct ratings. Um, we did multidimensional scaling of the dissimilarity data, and we also um, developed some uh, partial least square regression models um, to see. Um, uh, the influence of acoustical versus categorical um, descriptors. 
Um, uh, to explain a little bit more what the direct multi-stimulus brightness uh, ratings were, um, uh, some of you might be familiar with the MUSRA um, uh, procedure for, um, uh, it was developed originally for audio, uh, uh, testing audio codec quality. It is used a lot in, uh, in audio engineering perceptual studies about the quality of loudspeakers and things like that. Um, uh, and um, what we did here is we adapted it in order to provide a way for people to not just rate each sound individually, but somehow rate all the sounds together um, in order to also impose some sort of comparison. So each sound has to be rated as on a scale from not bright at all to very bright on its own. Um, but the fact that you rate many sounds together also gives you an idea of um, what you think is brighter than the other. Um, and um, in order to avoid having to do this for 14 sounds altogether, because that could lead to high cognitive load, we, um, uh, we had two steps, so two screens like this one. Um, each one had four, uh, half of the tested sounds, seven, plus two anchors, which were um, hidden repetitions of stimuli so that we can connect the first step with the second step uh, in the analysis. Um, and uh, the ratings were very consistent across the steps. So um, that sort of provided evidence that the approach was, was fine and um, uh, it was equally good uh, as if we had collected all the ratings in a single go. Um, and we extracted, of course, uh, some temporal and uh, spectral audio descriptors um, using the timer toolbox. Um, and some of the results, um, uh, well, actually their results. So um, we first looked at some clusters um, and um, on the left in the general dissimilarity, we can see that um, the way that uh, the stimuli are clustered based on, on the dissimilarity ratings seems to reflect um, uh, families, right? Instrument families so, or um, uh, kind of categorical source cause categories. So we have the pizzicati with the marimba and the harp. Um, we have the piano with the harpsichord. Um, we have the sustained violin and cello tones. And then we have the, the brass and the reeds together here. But when we perform the same clustering in the brightness dissimilarity data, um, it is uh, harder to explain, um, providing some sort of uh, uh, first indication that uh, maybe things there are a bit more acoustical. Um, and uh, this, this is the cophonetic correlation coefficient which sort of shows um, how well the, the cluster distances explain the empirical, the, the actual dissimilarity data of the, um, uh, provided by the listeners. Um, we also looked at inter-rater correlation um, in the three tasks, and uh, we have a higher uh, intercorrelation rating, uh, sorry, inter-rater correlation in the direct um, uh, task. So generally, it, it seems that for, for the kind of semantic rating task at hand, um, a direct rating might be more, uh, might make more sense than the similarity. And indeed, brightness dissimilarity um, had a less, had a lower, um, the lowest actually inter-rater correlation, indicating that it was not like, it was kind of a hard task, um, at least uh, compared to general dissimilarity and to direct um, ratings. Um, and then um, preparing for the multidimensional scaling analysis, we look at some um, metrics of, you know, how the solutions converge um, for different uh, number of dimensions. And we can see that um, the uh, general dissimilarity ratings needed at least two dimensions to be explained, um, perhaps three as usually. Um, whereas um, uh, brightness dissimilarity could actually be explained just with a one dimensional solution. So um, they started giving us um, evidence that um, uh, the complexity is lower from this data, so it's it might be more of a of a, of a one dimensional um, sorry of um, uh, a single component, let's say, uh, perceptual dimension. Um, and here we can see um, the results. Um, 
Uh, this link is provided um, on the conference website as part of the extra materials. So there you can see um, you can see these results, and you can by hovering over the uh, over the uh, stimuli positions, you can listen to the sounds. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, in the general dissimilarity, um, we have this dimension here, which is quite clearly kind of temporal. Um, then there's the second dimension, which is more, uh, it seems to be more spectral. And uh, in, in a bit, I will talk more about this. Um, and here we have a one dimensional um, solution of the brightness dissimilarity. Um, and the average um, ratings um, of uh, di the direct ratings. And you can see that basically um, it's more or less the same um, organization between the, the one dimensional solutions. Um, the only difference is that, uh, I mean, there are some small differences in the, in the exact placement of the sounds, but basically these two configurations are practically um, identical. In the two-dimensional uh, brightness dissimilarity solution, which we decided to look at so that we can compare it with the two-dimensional general dissimilarity, um, along this dimension here, um, the order is more or less retained, but we see some sort of compression in terms of, of that uh, vertical dimension. And um, I should say here that um, when you conduct MDS, usually um, you get two dimensions in an order, but this order is not as important as in factor analysis, for example. So it's not that dimension one explains more variance than dimension two, um, uh, but it's more uh, it's more like the order uh, given by uh, the algorithm. So um, in in the general dissimilarity, the first dimension you get eventually is the temporal one, whereas in brightness dissimilarity, as you would expect, the first dimension, the strong the stronger let's say dimension is um, uh, the more spectral one. And we can uh, we we run some correlations there. Um, in, uh, so this is Pearson's correlations, but we use the bootstrap analysis procedure uh, 10,000 times iterations. So in the parentheses, you can see the, um, the standard error after the, the bootstrap analysis. Um, and uh, indeed, these two dimensions here, dimension one of brightness and dimension two of general dissimilarity are quite close. Um, but there is an, a slightly stronger relationship between the temporal dimension of general dissimilarity and um, that second dimension of brightness dissimilarity. Um, and uh, when we go in the direct ratings, um, the direct ratings perfectly um, um, re, uh, retrieve um, the, the, the central dimension of brightness dissimilarity but um, only 0.77 of um, the, the so-called brightness dimension of the general dissimilarity. And they seem to retain a little bit, um, not significant, um, but somehow um, a correlation with um, the temporal. So there seems to be some sort of temporal influence in the, bright, in the direct brightness ratings. And uh, we looked at correlations with uh, speckled centroid and attack time, um, and uh, we had um, the usual results here, um, but for the second dimension of brightness dissimilarity, um, we did have um, uh, a, a significant correlation with attack time. Um, what this might imply is that there was some sort of leakage from general dissimilarity to brightness dissimilarity, um, or maybe um, there was uh, there is something about temporal cues in brightness perception. Um, because we used um, half subjects, uh, because we asked half of the subjects to do first brightness dissimilarity and then general dissimilarity um, and vice versa, um, we, we looked at the data and we ruled out any sort of um, influence of the order of the task. Um, and the final component was we performed some modeling of the dissimilarities, the, the general dissimilarities and the brightness dissimilarities. Um, we had the acoustical model, all our descriptors, and a categorical model where family resonator, um, continuous versus impulsive excitation, and blown, bold, struck, and plaque excitation were modeled as binary um, predictors, like you either belong to that or not. And these are the results. So in general dissimilarity, um, 
when you include in the combined model, when you include categorical descriptors, you have a significant increase in the model fit. So you explain the data better, which shows that um, uh, source cause categories influence general dissimilarity. However, this is not the case with brightness dissimilarity. So we interpret that as brightness being more of an acoustical, um, uh, a pure, let's say, acoustical dimension, um, not really influenced by source cause categories. Um, this is some extra analysis that it's not uh, very uh, um, informative anyways. So basically, um, we by triangulating these different methods, we corroborated that brightness is a salient component of general timbre perceptions. Timbre, uh, timbral brightness, as modeled by the spectral centroid, is a relatively robust unitary dimension. Um, and this observed correlation between brightness dissimilarity ratings and the attack time dimension of the general dissimilarity space seems to suggest that brightness dissimilarities dissimilarity may have been infiltrated by general dissimilarity, which led us to ask the question um, if uh, faster might also be brighter. And I know I'm running out of time, so I will try to conclude within the next uh, three or four minutes by quickly um, taking you through the next study. So the next study had two parts. Um, both parts had direct multi-stimulus ratings. In the first part, we used 24 acoustic notes, the same 14 plus a new set of, of 10 to, to create an expanded, more diverse set. Um, and uh, again, it was done with German native speakers, um, similar, uh, like uh, students in a music department in Vienna. Um, and um, here, actually, I can quickly show you the... Um, this is the order of the sounds from the least to the most bright. Um, so the vibraphone seems to still be the most uh, bright at all. And you can explore the data here. Um, and uh, we run uh, a linear mixed model trying to understand um, whether the attack time extracted from the sounds or the speckled centroid, how they interact. And uh, indeed, um, the effect of, of the um, uh, attack time was significant, and there was an even more significant interaction between attack and speckled centroid, um, which we decided to, to examine further using synthetic sounds. So in the same experiment with the same uh, listeners, we created 64 uh, stimuli uh, based on um, uh, a paper by Kaplan and colleagues in 2005. So basically we had uh, additive synthetic tones, uh, 20 harmonics in total, all played at 311 Hertz. Um, and we controlled three parameters of the sounds, the spectral centroid, the attack time, and um, what Kaklin called spectral flux, um, a half cycle sinusoidal variation of the, central, of the spectral centroid in the first 100 milliseconds. You can think of that as, you know, as the, the higher frequencies arriving a bit later than the lower ones. So think of brass instruments, for example. Um, and we uh, took four um, equally distanced um, uh, parameters uh, for each of these three. The original paper of Kathleen had 16 steps. We only used, we sampled like at four um, equally distance points. Um, and again, we, we use the direct multi stimulus ratings. Um, and this is here um, the example of the sounds. So these are the four different categories of speckled centroid. Um, the differences are very subtle. Um, and of course, the experiment was done with uh, very careful equipment in an isolated room in Vienna. Um, and um, I probably I won't have time to play this now, but maybe I can show you here a little bit. So. This is an example of this um, delay of the higher harmonics versus like a more uh, faster version. Uh, sorry, which would be here. The difference is very subtle, but um, we will see in a bit what exactly happened. Um, this is how the sounds were ordered. So generally, they were ordered by speckled centroid. So speckled centroid somehow, yes, it is a very good predictor of brightness. Um, the differences are not super strong, of course, because there were a lot of stimuli, not a lot of uh, participants. Um, and here we can see a little bit how 
pairs of the three of, of the three parameters interact when the other parameter changes. Um, so this is, for example, the relationship of centroid and attack for the four steps of the flukes. Nothing really important happens there. Um, when we modify flukes and centroid um, at the four attack times, something um, interesting appears, but it's not very strong. And finally, um, the interaction between flukes and attack time at the four different centroids is, is even more complex. And um, uh, a fixed effects model, sorry, um, a mixed effects model um, showed some moderate effects for um, the spectral flukes and the attack time, but they were not um, significant at the 0 0.05 um, level. So there is some evidence for a perceptual effect of attack time and harmonic rise asynchrony, um, but uh, of course, more, more research and perhaps different type of stimuli could shed a better light in this kind of questions. Um, what seems to happen is that between sounds with very close spectral centroid values, those with faster attacks or with faster rising partials might be perceived as brighter. And um, uh, if you examine uh, this very carefully, you can actually see some of these things repeated um, for certain uh, values of the parameters. Um, and of course, we should always keep in mind that acoustic instrument sounds, because we did see an effect of attack time in the uh, musical stimuli, the non-synthetic stimuli. And this might be because um, real sounds exhibit an inherent correlation of spectral and temporal features that we still have not managed to really um, have an experimental design where we can um, uh, disentangle um, these dimensions. Um, so I think uh, that's all. These are some general uh, evidence. Uh, thank you and sorry for, for running a bit of time. Thank you very much, uh, Charis. So <clears throat> we have uh, essentially one minute and a half for uh, questions, uh, but uh, you're welcome to jump in. Anyone, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And on the... Yeah, uh, two questions for uh, from Marco. <laughs> Yes, hello. Thank you. I have very, very short, uh, very short questions. The first is, uh, um, how do you compute the attack time? Uh, because it's, I mean, the sounds that you presented are banal in terms of computation of attack time, but I can imagine a much more complex sound. And I wonder how, which, which formula you're using, which criteria you're using. The second question is also not even shorter. Uh, uh, besides being an homage to David Wessel's temporal space, uh, is the choice of an E flat, uh, uh, then why, why the reason of a choice of an E flat as a pitch uh, for, uh, for, for your experiment? Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, the, uh, I'll start with the second question. So, um, uh, so this, uh, this pitch seems to be generally um, selected um in many like timber studies um and uh the general i think assumption is that it is kind of in the middle um for most of the instrument ranges um and of course you know this is another big question in itself but timber and pitch um are kind of bound together so um always when we talk about timber perception at a specific pitch we miss something um and because we used that pitch for the so for the acoustic stimuli, we decided to go for the same pitch um, for the uh, synthetic stimuli, which is also what Kaplan did um, in in their paper, where they they used the synthetic stimuli to try to understand a bit better uh, Macadam's the Macadam's ninety nine five um, timer space. Um, as far as the other question is concerned, I guess uh, I can go quickly back here. Right, so the, the attack time is a simple linear ramp. Um, so yeah, nothing uh, sophisticated. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. But I mean, if because the, your sounds are extremely simple, uh, you can uh, deduce the attack with the ramp. But imagine a, a, a sound where 
which has a much more complex attack. Um, uh, I don't know, a scratch, a scratch crescendo of a symbol, if you would, a causal description. Um, and uh, what do you, uh, would you imagine something else or would you this attack detection only work with the simple linear uh, profiles? I mean, I think, I think uh, you, yeah, you have a very good point there. And I think that's why in the, in the acoustic stimuli, we did see an effect of a top, of a top time. Um, so um, the fact that we didn't see the effect in, uh, in the synthetic stimuli could be uh, because um, our design of the synthetic stimuli is not the best, our choice. Uh, maybe uh, some more um, complex design of, of the attack synthetically could lead to different results. Um, that could be a very interesting um, extension of the work. Um, or it might well be that, you know, purely um, in a synthetic, in a pure synthetic um, uh, context where the attack time is disentangled and it's on its own, this kind of like simple linear ramp, it has no effect on brightness, but maybe it does um, in, in, in real sounds um, in relationship to, to um, being more complex and more related with the spectral envelope as well. Okay, we are, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry to be uh, pressing, but we are uh, running out of time. There is a question from uh, Patrick Suzini in the, in the chat. I suggest uh, you to yes during the, the, the salon time at the coffee break. Uh, unless you can reply to it in uh, 30 seconds, Charisse. Uh, how do you define bright? I cannot see the whole chat. Could you? Uh, uh, really? I, can, I can read the question. Uh, thank you, Thetis, for the presentation. Uh, yes, my question is about how do you define uh, brightness during the, the rating uh, or the dissimilarity experiments to the participants? Yes, good question. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, no, we, we did not define it. We just uh, let them uh, define it on their own. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's... Uh, mm. Well, of, of course, there is also the, the whole uh, polysemy semantic polysemy question, but um, I think overall the average data show that people um, eventually moved between, you know, how much high energy there is in the spectrum. Thank you.